Hey, this is Glendon Cameron with another edition of Hustle Nomics. This will be in podcast form, so you can just press play and let it go. The title of this se- segment is Hustle Nomics The Money Math. Numbers never lie. I learned this lesson a long, long time ago when I encountered a gentleman by the name of Danny. Danny was one of those guys that was smarter than he looked, and he looked pretty smart. Just kind of unassuming, but I learned a lot from this guy. It was when we had our first booth in the flea market, Latonia, Georgia. I remember the weekend. It was pretty good. Booth rent was $165, and that weekend did about $250, and Danny comes over, and at this point, I'm happy, right, but there's a few problems. The booth is literally empty. I did stumble upon dealing with bigger, higher profit items, but I didn't have a plan. I didn't do the money math. And Danny just came up to me, talked to me for five minutes. He's like, you know, whenever you get a booth, whatever you do, you put two to three items in that booth that will either get half your booth rent or all of your booth rent since you are now dealing with larger stuff. He said, always do the math. If you want your booth to make $1,000 a month, see what your sales rates are, divide that by 20%, 30%, whatever it is, you know, it will fluctuate and you will pretty much be, get to predictable income. And in the world of resale, people's like, there's no such thing as predictable income, you know. And actually, I'm here to tell you this. Following this advice, I went ahead and did the money math. And I'm going to give you the numbers that I felt were compelling at the time. But really, I was undershooting. If you want to gross $100,000 per year, You have to realize, you have to break it down to all of its components. The first component is, what is $100,000 per month? It's $800,333.33 per month. Then you break it down per week, which is $2,083.33. Then you break it down per day. $297.62. $297.62. Oh, we're not done. Because in the new economy, which started about 30 years ago, you can make money 24 hours a day. You do not do the typical 40-hour work week. Because if you are leveraging the tools of the internet, social media, and other things, you're putting yourself in a situation to make money 24 hours a day seven days a week, 365 days a year. So we break it down per hour, which is based on a 24-hour cycle. It's $12.40. That's the money math. Since you are leveraging everything you can, and you know we're going to break this down in different ways. Because say you have a job. Those numbers are covered. You already know what you're going to make per month. Then you just like, okay, I already have this. You take your job, you put that money in, and then it's like, how far are you away from hundred thousand? I'm using hundred thousand for a reason, which I'll explain in a few minutes. And then you create your money math off of that. Everything is based on a twenty-four hour cycle, because that's what messes people up. Because the trading time for dollars model is so old that it's very hard to mentally shift from. You'll have people who create their own businesses that will operate on a 40-hour week, a 160-hour month. That's what they'll base their pay on or feel they're doing pretty good. But if you're in business and you're leveraging the internet, money is a 24-hour endeavor. And if you're not doing things to make sure that you can earn money 24 hours a day. You are essentially leaving money on the table. 
Seriously, I don't care what you do. There is some way that you can either actually make a sale, which is your primary position, and your secondary position is either gain leads 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, let's talk about the $100,000 figure. For many people, that is the benchmark of success. If you have a job and you make $100,000 a year, you roughly depend upon your tax situation. You're going to bring home 55 grand. I know that's like, what? Yeah, 55 grand, depending on what state you live in. Or if you're a really smooth operator and you know how to use the tax system for your advantage, you'll bring home 85, I'm going to say high 78, 78 to 85, if you really know how to pimp the system, because you're only going to pay, you know, your state tax, FICA, Medicare, things like that, and you won't pay any federal tax, and this can be done legally, but you must know the system, you must have things in place. But the $100,000 mark is, oh, it's the big holy grail. And once you break it, you know, you do 100000 and you can do 120 and you can do 140 and you can do 150 What happens is, and I've seen it in myself and I've seen it with my friends, is when you get to a certain level of income that you can buy whatever, do whatever, and it replenishes itself pretty quickly, you're not as motivated to make more money, which is a mistake. It's a huge, huge, huge mistake because, as we all know, whatever you're doing can radically change. Markets change. You change. Your desires change. Many, many things are in a state of change. So going ahead and predicating your life and your expenses and your desires on that figure At any moment, it could be pulled from under you. And this is another part of the money math. We live in an age where just about anyone can have a home-based business. Anyone. And when I say home-based business, I don't care if it makes $50 a month. It is a legitimate home-based business. When people use the terms relationships or business they make this immediate mental leap to a very successful relationship or a very successful business. Just because a business makes $50 a month does not mean it's not successful. It means it's a budding, growing business. And that's very viable. So that's one of the things that trips up people. And like any time that the lottery amounts are pretty low, it's like, oh, two million, that's not enough. From a person who's making 25000 per year. This is how people tend to think. And it's a little nutty at times. But when you are setting up your money matrix, have a written plan of generating at a minimum four, three to four income streams. If you have a job, fine. You need two more. If you're married... You, you, your wife works or your husband works, you have a job, she has a job, you need one more or two more. And uh, this is the reason why. We are heading toward a, an amazing future for people who are prepared and a living nightmare for people who are not. We're running into a place where we're having people Essentially, create we're creating people faster than we could create traditional jobs for those people. People are not being replaced. They're being displaced. When you step in the water and a puddle of water and it flows over and spreads out, that's displacement. And when you pull your foot out of that puddle, what happens? Unless there's more rain or whatever the water source is. It goes to a lower level and it stays there. That is what's happening with our economy. That is what's happening with certain sector jobs. They're being eradicated by technology. And the pace seems blazingly fast right now. Well, it's just begun. 
because as technology increases, the rate of displacement is going to accelerate. Give you an example. Remote cart shop, uh, remote shopping cart technology, which is ribbon or gumball. Essentially, you could take a link and put it in a tweet. You could put it on Facebook. You, it is a game changer because Amazon did this study, and, that's, and Amazon is the one that had the one-click checkout because if there's any friction between the buying in and the final purchase, there's this thing that call, that's called shopping cart abandonment. It doesn't take much for a person to flake out on a sale. So <clears throat> with remote shopping cart technology, such as you know ribbon, gumball, and others, it creates a faster, more immediate grat- gratification deal. I am currently experimenting with ribbon. I am currently experimenting with gumball. Um, my place with ribbon is about a month, you know, the first month. It's okay. There's a few issues. There's, you know, but it's beta. And anytime I sign up to a service and they let me know beforehand it's beta, I don't lose my mind when things go wrong because it's beta. However, Gumball is a little further along, much smoother, slicker presentation. And if the feedback that I'm getting, Gumball is going to win out over Ribbon, but then again, Ribbon could step their game up. I don't know, but I'm going to continue to test both and see where we are. But this displacement is the reason that even if you are financially secure, even if you have money in the bank, you need to generate more income streams because at any point something can happen. And then this is what happens with people. And this is one of the reasons that I say this frequently in my YouTube videos and here, manage your money or your money's going to manage you. You could be in a position where you are managing your money and then one or two things happen, then bam, your money's managing you. And it creates in a serious emotional hardship because feelings of it being unfair, feelings of it being incredibly wrong. These things surface and create angst and actually reduce your energy, the energy that you need to combat this problem. And it makes things worse. So with the Holy Grail of $100,000, you now know at a minimum, and this is just gross, you have to earn $8,300 a month from your business, jobs, or a combination of your revenue streams. This is another thing that I'm going to talk about. Stacking your revenue. Because one of the things that's going on is it's not impossible, but it's becoming more and more challenging to be dependent upon just one income. Uh, I will give you some examples. When I first started into this space of being an information marketer, that's that's exactly what I am. I'm, I'm an author. I create content. The genesis of everything I do is creating content. Whether it's a YouTube video, a podcast, a book, an e-book, audio book, all of that is content. The rest is presentation and placing in the right sales channels. It's, I'm oversimplifying because there's more to it, but that's the gist of it. I was blown away because I came from the old economy. I grew up and I remember when gas was like 55 cents. I remember going to get gas at the convenience store to cut our front and back lawn. Usually took a gallon and a half because we were on two acres and we had Bermuda grass in the front and some crazy crap in the back. And I remember going through all of these things and, and you know, these, these, th- these changes and just seeing this. So being firmly rooted in that old economy, I was mentally positioned that I had to trade time, hours for money. Because everything I did, except, except collect Coca-Cola bottles, because back then you can go around and say, hey, Mr. Jones or Mrs. Giles or Mr. Uh, Miller, Mr. Kirkpatrick, may I have your bottles if you don't want them so I can earn some extra money. Now, that wasn't a per hour deal. That was if I could collect however many per hour, I would make 
a lot more money. And, you know, it's like I collected one bottle an hour. I only made five cents. If I collected 50, I made, you know, 250. So looking at how this would go. And back then, 250, sorry, 2 dollars and 50 cents for a kit was some pretty nice pocket scratch because candy was five cents or a penny. A candy bar was a quarter. A dr- I mean, seriously, two dollars and fifty cents would go a long way. So coming from that economy, and my first serious one hundred percent foray into the new economy was when I wrote my first book, which in the beginning I suffered. It was going okay, but it was great part time money. But my goal was to make full time money, and. It was a good move because I entered the spot and I entered the space that no one else was in. The good part about that was there was no one in the space. The bad part about that was there was no one in the space. It was unproven. And really, it took me about four months of experimentation to really learn how to sell my books. It was just like, I will do this. I did blogs. I spent all this time listening to people. And when it clicked... It clicked. I remember the first time waking up and it was like 1500 bucks that wasn't there the day before in my payout accounts for my merchant account. I was like, whoa. And then, you know, I would go out and spend two thousand dollars and within three or four days I had it back again. That was very, very exciting. And it also opened up something that I'm going to talk about much deeper in Hustlenomics creating your own products, whether they're digital or actually physical. Because I actually know a lot about both. But that was my first foray into making money and being essentially the factory, the distribution center, the sales channel, and the marketing arm. Pretty much everything was in-house, production to the end-user sale. And it was like eye-opening. Because when I tell you that you can do this stuff, I'm not speaking from a position of someone that had years and years of experience of doing this before I started. I didn't know what I was doing. And then 14 months, I made $62,000. Not a month, not 30 days, but 14 months, which in my mind is pretty good. When you base it on the average household income or the average income, which is like about 32 grand a year 28 to 32 grand a year that's where a lot of people are like over half the countries in that pay range so it was like twice that from something i've never done and that just shows you the power of the new economy and as you stay and study this stuff it becomes better and better now back to the numbers for you to achieve your numbers you must know what your numbers are And going back to, you know, Danny, once I got that information of, okay, booth rents 150, I guess the thing is it's 165, then the second booth it was 150, then the third booth it went down to 135, and that's where it stayed for each booth after that. And at one time we had 21 booths because taking that five-minute conversation, and it's not enough to know your numbers, you must act upon them. I stacked the booth. Now, remember. It was Saturday, you know, it was sold out. I had stuff to do, um, but this flea market was open Thursday through Monday at the time. So I came back, and I was a little different. 150 I put four items in that booth that were 100 to $200. Then I stacked a bunch of $50 items, and I stacked a lot of, you know, essentially the cheapest thing in that booth was 25 bucks. Made booth rent. The next day on the Monday, which was typically slow because I wasn't operating from a point of what I call. I got to get money hustler mentality. I got to get money. I got to get money. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. There's no methodology. It's just I got to get money. Buy some, flip some, get money. Buy some, flip some, get money. That is a vicious cycle to get on, and it's long-term a recipe for disaster. It is a total recipe for disaster because 
You're not building your customer base. You're not really learning. You're learning how to hustle and your inducement to make money is a crisis. You want to get away from that path. You know, this this, this book title is coming. Is, I'm still working on how to put it all together, but essentially it's going to be called How to Get the High Without Being a Crackhead or something like that because essentially every time you do these things, you train yourself to respond accordingly in similar situations. So if you are, I'm a guy to get money hustler, you are going to train yourself to peak performance only when you're facing a crisis versus training yourself to reach peak performance all the time, whether there's a crisis or not, you know, that's much better. But when I was operating on solid information I was stacking the boost properly, and this is when I became a data junkie. I would watch people on days I wasn't at the storage auctions. I would sit there, and I would do traffic counts. All of this data helped me build a better business, and data and numbers are the, you know one and the same to me. They're concrete variables that you can plug in to some type of equation, a formula, if you will, and produce repeatable success. That's the ticket, repeatable success, not some high arching, I bought something for a dollar, I made 80 grand, that's wonderful, it's a lovely story, it's awe-inspiring, you'll tell it to the grandkids forever, but a product that you can acquire for five bucks and sell for $20, 365 days a year and sell 10 of those is a much better deal. It is a totally better deal because it's more consistent, it's more stable, and it's repeatable. So taking that information, went from one booth to two booths to three booths to four booths. And then there was what I call the money quad. I had four booths that were stacked with furniture, everything in there, 100 bucks or more. Those booths usually paid the booth rent plus produced a profit. The other booths, there was booths that were full of nothing but clothes. There were booths that were full of nothing but knickknacks. There were booths full of nothing but toys. Because each book, excuse me, each booth had its own personality, so to speak. Because my partner, I used to call her Arts and Crafts because she would do these things and they would facilitate and make you know robust sales. And the frustration with the flea market was, you know, we didn't own anything. So we had to deal with rules whenever they wanted to close. They had to close. Couldn't get the key to the place, which, you know, really hurt my restocking efforts. It was a lot of stuff that went into it. And also, if you did the math, you know, since we're talking numbers, there was 21 booths at one time. And at a minimum, I was paying 135 for the booth. Yeah, it was up there. Uh, we were making the money to pay the rent. And we were putting money in their pockets. So essentially, the first store, and this is more about the money math, the rent was $1,000. However, you know, we had 100% access, come and go as we please. But we did not have the traffic. (laughs) We didn't have the traffic. So we traded one problem for a huge problem, which, once again, listening to Danny, we had a thousand square foot store, stacked it up with furniture, odd items. And and essentially at this juncture, we were looking for a warehouse. And we were still doing garage sales because the traffic at the first store was anemic. It was horrible, but it was a great spot for Craigslist. It got to the point that if I put up 100 ads a day on Craigslist, yes, 100 ads a day, 20 ads would get a response. Now, those 20 responses, there would be three to four sales. A phenomenal amount of work, so I had to make it work it. But by doing the math and knowing what I had to do, I created this repeatable process that guaranteed that we were able to pay the rent, we were able to make money, and then we had another problem. The smalls, the little toys and stuff that we didn't have the space for that. So my partner would have a garage sale at her house one weekend, And I would have a garage sale at my house one weekend. And that's how we moved all of that stuff. And when I'm at the garage sale, my partner would be at the store. Or sometimes she'd stay home and I would stay at the store. Because, you know, Sundays were just dead ducks for this location. 
But once again, I just did the math and going, and this is how we got to the warehouse. And we went, we actually moved into the warehouse situation was like three times. And, you know, I put out later, that was actually two warehouses because being on a storage auction trail, people get in your business. When people get in your business, they know how to play you. They know how to bid you. They didn't know I had the cap- the capacity to hold more stuff. So the second warehouse was actually the first warehouse because we went up to 10,000 square feet. And then my landlord said, like, well, you know, I'll make you a deal on this other one. And I was like, we didn't need it. But I looked at the numbers. It's like, I can buy enough to fill this warehouse up in a month or two. Easy. It actually took two months, but it was well worth it. But the deal is, you must know your numbers. And I'm saying your numbers because I gave you the $100,000 breakdown. Like I said, you know, once again. And I'm repeating this because I want you to listen to this a few times. Because once it sinks in, you're, you're going to like, oh, man, it clicks. Your numbers, and I want you to do this. I want you to think about it. You know, $8,333.33. Say you have a job and your take home is $3,000. Okay, you have to generate $5,333.33 to hit the six figure mark. Gross. Because you're going to have expenses on your business side. So you you do that whole thing. You break down like five thousand. What is that per week? Just off the top of my head, you know that's going to be about twelve fifty. Yeah, twelve fifty something, maybe thirteen fifty something like that per week, and then that's going to be probably you know you do that times seven. That's like two something a day. And then you start taking this information and stacking up your sales channel. It's like, okay, I have three thousand dollars here. All right, I need to make five thousand. I can do three thousand on eBay gross sales, and we're going to include the gross. We didn't include the gross on your take home pay because taxes and stuff are coming out. So okay, you do three. That brings down your number to two thousand. What can I do? Oh, I can do Amazon, and then. This is where the magic really starts to work. First thing you do is you get tracking. You put your stuff on eBay for, you know, three months. And you put your stuff up on Amazon. And each week, each week, you track your sales. And over a period of six weeks to three months, certain trends are going to pop out at you. For your numbers. And what I'm going to say, your numbers, and this is one of the biggest problems on the internet or YouTube. People are seeking advice that has universal application. And it's very hard when you have Joe, who's 56 years old, was a Marine, who's a can-do guy, built his own house with his own bare two hands, and you have... John, who's 28 years old, the product of a single mother household, he doesn't even know where the oil goes in the car. And I know this sounds sexist, but I'm getting somewhere with this. Yet, you got one guy who has a high level of confidence. You have another guy who has marginal confidence at best, and you give them the same exact advice, and you're going to have two totally different outcomes. You know, John's going to be pissed and feel that he got robbed or scammed because it wasn't easy. Whereas the guy who could build a house with his own two hands is like, oh, this is just what I'm looking for. This is awesome because he's already running and he can take this information. And, you know, with your numbers, they're going to be radically different from someone else's numbers because you are a different person. You live in a different town. You have a different set of friends, you have different interests, you have different strengths, you have different weaknesses. So that's why I keep saying your numbers. There is nothing that can replace sitting down and taking three to six months to figure out what your numbers are. You At this point, you may lose money. You may make money. It really just depends. But once you go through this exercise of what you have to do, it becomes easier to hit that six-figure mark because you're not operating 
on a blind set of assumptions or just hope. Or as I remember one day I was at the storage auction and this guy bought this unit and he paid way too much and he knew it. And he said the most foolish thing I've ever heard on a storage auction trail. He paid 1500 bucks for the unit. There was stuff that was clearly broken in the front. And he says, in there, it's in there. It's gotta be in there. You know, he was pushing hope in that unit and that unit said, it regurgitated that hope and he lost $800. It doesn't have to be in there. It's not going to be in there. But when you do the hard work of crunching your numbers, you would make better decisions for your business. The other day in one of my e-commerce groups, someone had put up a question like, who makes the decision in your business? And everyone was like, I do, I do. And I just put up data. Because when I was making the decisions in my business, Sometimes they were good decisions. Sometimes they were bad. Whenever I make a decision based on data, the outcome is always favorable each and every time. Now, understand, it's good data because I work very hard to get good data. And I should make that distinction and be really clear about that. You want to have good data and accurate data to the best of your abilities. And I work really hard on that. But whenever I made a decision based on great data, the results were outstanding 100% of the time. So what I want you to do is become a data monkey, a numbers cruncher. You know, this is the stuff because, you know, I want you to think about this. You know, numbers are, aren't sexy, but investment bankers, analysts, people that work Wall Street, they, <clears throat> they, they crunch numbers. They look at numbers. They make love in the numbers. They bitch slap numbers. And these people make anywhere from $250,000 a year. And this is someone out of a, one of the top, you know, graduate programs going straight to Wall Street, like 150, 200 grand first year up to by their 10th year, they're making two, three, four, five, six, seven, 20 million a year crunching numbers. Ponder that for a second. Because when you crunch the numbers the correct way, you have predictable and favorable results. That's how important it is to love your numbers. Now, with your numbers, there is a period of darkness. You're not going to have enough information to really, you know, you could kind of like wing it, but until you get some data, some sales history, it's hard to have numbers. And if you ever pay attention to these money shows or they're talking about stocks or talking about companies and they'll say, Year-to-year sales increased from this. If you have to know what your sales were last year so you can prepare them to your sales this year. And it, it's just eye-opening because sometimes you think you're sucking wind. And I'll give you an example. Our third year in, I remember I was looking at the year-to-year sales. And I thought, you know, because I had bought some really crap units. And we had money and I was living well and my partner was living well, but it didn't feel like, you know, it was, er, it didn't feel like we were more successful. But when I went to January and I looked at the numbers, we were up $20,000 that month over the year, the previous year. And I was like, whoa. And I just kind of perked up and I was like, whoa, that's significant. And the money was there. It's just it didn't feel like it because our entry into the storage auction business was a swift ascent. We just kind of went in and bam. And then it just kind of leveled out because we were leveled out as the data revealed, not due to the fact that our, we had lost our mojo. We had hit our infrastructure, infrastructure ceiling. And this is another thing that data revealed. When you're at a point where, you, you, you know, when you open up, you know, you, you you can make money or when you first start, you know, it's like I said, there's nothing to really look back on. But when you've been in business for two years, three years and your income stagnates, either you have an information gap, but usually it's an infrastructure problem. An infrastructure could be online assets, offline assets, such as a warehouse truck. Somewhere along the line is usually your infrastructure. I recently did a consult with someone and, you know, it, it brought out some stuff because I will share this with you. Uh, he has a uh, significant other and she isn't really feeling the business. 
And I sniffed that out because he's like, I try not to use her SUV, which is a Yukon. And he has like an Acura Integra. And I was like, let's stop. And I was like, look, you have an infrastructure problem. You have this larger vehicle. You're buying based on what's going to fit in your car. The same thing that happened that I put in making money A to Z with self-storage units, how people were buying units based on what they can move versus the real value of what they could get for the unit because they were buying based on capabilities versus buying on value. He was doing that same thing because of his car. And I was like, look, you know, car paid off, trade it, get a truck, get a van. You have to improve your infrastructure to increase your money. And I can tell you, you know, I haven't talked to him, but I know once he makes that change, he may double his income. That's how huge infrastructure is. So as the data revealed for our business, we had an infrastructure problem because, you know, like I said, two going to the third year, it was kind of income that kind of like to stop and... I was like, okay, well, you know, what are we doing? And I understand this was like leaving the flea market, opening up the first store, getting into the warehouse, getting to the second warehouse. And when I had my affiliation with the pharma drug deal, all this stuff kind of happened in like an eighth month period. And we like doubled our income because we doubled our infrastructure. And I didn't know, I wouldn't have known in what direction to go if I didn't keep track of the data. That's how important that stuff is. So you've got to know what your numbers are, not what Billy's numbers are or Susan's numbers or Billy Joe Bob or Leroy or Tupac or whoever. You need to know what your numbers are. Now, this is another way for you to reach goals. Say you need to do a $15,000 addition to your house. You've gone out, you've gotten three, four estimates. And it's kind of coming between, you know, four, 13 to 15 grand. So you're probably going to need 17 because, you know, stuff happens when you're doing this. So you're like, okay, I need $17,000. If you take that $17,000 and break it up to how much is that per month? How much is it per week? How much is per day? When you get down a day, because when I tell you that to make 100000 a year, you have to create a situation where you're making $12.40 every hour in the 24-hour cycle. It's like, yeah, but twelve forty doesn't like throw your mind like when I say $8,333. You're like, whoa, that's a lot of money. But and it's the same thing. It's how it's broken down. It's how it's presented. And it's how you come up with a situation to achieve those ends. Because when you break up the elephant, because that's what I did with $100,000, those little pieces that fit in your hand and you can bounce around your fingers, they're much more manageable, not only physically, but mentally. Because when you hear $100,000, $833 a month, a lot of people are like, whoa, you know, they have to feed it before they start it. But with the numbers, another beautiful thing that happens, give you an example using me. I'm still consider myself a rookie in the internet marketing information business because August 6th, which isn't that far away, would be my fourth year. And I really think I've learned more in the last year than I did in the previous three. With that, using data plus some other research is one of the reasons that I went to the audiobooks when other people were not even looking at audiobooks. It's like I had a writer friend tell me that I was, she's like, I would never, ever listen to an audiobook. And I said, okay, that's you. Because what you have conversations with people, they will push off their perspectives and their wishes and desires on you as if you should adopt them. And I already know the math. Now, the thing is, you're looking at data. I'm getting ready to do a lot of different things, which will be presented in Hustlenomics. Because I should tell you the numbers and the data is another reason that I have toned down and decelerated from the resale world. What I see five years from now, you know, right now there's plenty of money to be made. You still go to storage auctions and get stuff. But I see that people are becoming more and more aware of the value of everything. 
You know, I, I watch videos on YouTube. I watch forums where people are like, I, I keep hearing this. Like, I went to this garage sale, and they were charging eBay prices. And I'm hearing it more and more and more and more and more because the information gap between the average person and the reseller is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is going to create product compression for resellers. I put up a video recently about how to make 200 bucks a day using the Eco ATM. And people were like, you know, debating me because there's some uh, responses I need to answer, but I haven't had the time because I was dealing with this uh, head cold. But essentially, due to disruption and displacement, it's going to be very, very easy for the average person to resell our stuff. You're going to have just people who have a lot of excess who want to donate to worthy causes. Because I predict in the next five years, most thrift stores, resale stores that are on top of the ball game. Because if you think about it, if their mission is to help others, if they can make more money by selling the stuff that pickers go to stores and buy and flip online, at some point, someone's going to make it very easy through the technology, some new way, some new training that they're going to be able to do that, and you're not going to have these things at thrift stores. And going to garage sales, you're going to have people, it's, it's going to be a book, it's going to be something that's going to make it very easy for people to sell this stuff and get max value, which means it's going to get really interesting for the average reseller. Those who are building bigger enterprises, I think, will be okay. I could be 100% wrong about this, but in my gut... And based on the data, I feel that's where we're heading because of the disruptive economy. And like I said, five years, maybe seven, you're going to see a big shift in the resale picking community because the average person is getting information. And that information gap is closing, closing, closing. Why would someone sell you a bike on Craigslist for 50 bucks? When they can sell that same bike in the proper channel and realize 250, 300, 400, 500 bucks. People are going to become very aware of the value of everything. And it's going to make it very daunting if your inventory and you, your way of making money is dependent upon people not knowing the value of what they have. You're going to see a huge, huge shift in this. And that's why Storage Wars and America Pickers and the Antique. This stuff keeps growing because, you know, it's like, why are there like, what, four or five storage auction shows? Pawn, because people want to know the value. They like the deal. And it's going to become very daunting, in my opinion. But if you are creating products, if you're doing innovative things, you're managing your own economy. It's a different ball game because you're creating things or you're making things better. It's something that you can control. More so than hopping in your car, going to a storage auction, or hopping in your car and going to a garage sale, or hopping in your car and going to a thrift store. That's just my opinion, because I toyed around with it, and I made the final decision that I was going to stay on the path that I'm currently on. Because for me, in my personality, it would be really hard for me to be good at doing the YouTube videos and writing books and doing podcasts, and also be working 40, 60, 70 hours a week out there in storage units. So, you know, it's an opportunity cost. I forego doing that full-time because I do a little flipping here and there because I like it. And it's more of a hobby than it is an income producer, oddly enough, because I make more money doing what I do from the YouTube, from writing books, from helping other people do what I'm doing. But when you flesh out your numbers, it could be very illuminating. Now, your numbers should be based on your life plan. Because once again, going back to the get money hustler, who someone who's usually saying that is either they need to get money so they can impress chicks. They need to get money because they have an urgent bill. As they said, for a long time, there's no retirement plan for Certain hustlers, drug dealers, and pimps, because they spend the money as soon as it comes in. 
as a disruptive ninja, you're hustling, but you're hustling with a purpose, a plan, and some direction. Totally different ballgame. Totally different ballgame. But this is your task from this Hustle Nomics episode. Find out what all your numbers are. What do you currently need to do? If you have no job, then you know you need to make $8,333.33 per month to hit six figures gross. What is your numbers to get to 100 grand? Plug it in. And then once you start breaking it down, it's like, okay, say you have the ability to do this thing or you have this talent that makes you 1200 bucks a month. And it takes two days a week. Okay, so eight days out the month, you can do that, and you add that to your money matrix. See, once you start thinking and looking at what you can do, because the thing is, you could have one thing that brings in this $8,333.33, or you can have 12 things that bring in the money. Because, see, the deal is to get to that sum. Because I say, you know, going back to the $100,000, ha, holy grail, is when you get to that level, and in most cities, like in New York, that could be chump change. In San Francisco, a lot of cities in, in, in uh, California, you're barely making it. But if you're like in Boogaloo, Iowa, and you're bringing, and you, you're making six figures, and like, say, the rent on the high side of town, six some a month, you're balling out. I mean, seriously, six figures, even with taxes, whatever, in many parts of the country, you're living very, very well, extremely well, even today, 2013. And what I'm going to talk about this, because, you know, this is the end of this episode, is how to massage this and how to crank it and how to even make the numbers shine and jump and dance even more for you. All right. This is Glendon Cameron, and this is another episode of Hustle Numics. 